I think it began with Ayn Rand, really. I had read The Fountainhead in my first year of college at the University of Winnipeg in Canada, and it just was blew me away. It was just so shocking to me what she was saying in that book, and then I read the Atlas Shrugged and got more into the political ideas, and then started reading some of the nonfiction she wrote, and then started reading some of the nonfiction she recommended, things like Henry Hazlitt, Economics in One Lesson, and Ludwig von Mises, and so on. And I just found myself drawn to the economics. And I, was, I started arguing with my professors. I was a math major, so I was arguing with one of these math professors. And uh, what I noticed in our discussions and in my arguments with people generally is that even if you started from a principle, the government should, shouldn't do X or whatever because people have rights, it very quickly got to the issue of practicality within one or two rounds of the argument. And when you get into issues of, <clears throat> of practic practicality, you get into the issues often of economics. And so here I was advocating something that seemed right, but I didn't know how practical it was. And this, this math professor I argued with said, well, I admit you beat me in this particular argument, but I'm a math professor. If your arguments are so good, why don't you go over to the economics department and, are, and see what they have to say about it? And so I did, and I took this textbook written by Paul Samuelson. We had the Canadian edition, Samuelson and Scott, Anthony Scott wrote the Canadian portions of it. And it was a whole year-long course in a standard university in Canada. And halfway through that course, I said, whatever else I know about the world, there's one thing I know. I'm never going to be an economist. And then, around the time I came to that decision, because it was my last year of, you know, of college, Harold Demsetz came to our school. Our Libertarian Club had him give uh, three talks over two days that just opened my eyes to what people on the edge of the mainstream could do with economics, that they could get real jobs, uh, and so on. And so that, it just, step by step, I was led that way. I remember one thing that Harold Demsetz, in the, in the question and answer especially, was often answering by referring to an article or another article, a number of articles in the Journal of Law and Economics. And he said, when he left Winnipeg, he said, you should come to Chicago and get a PhD. And he said, and buy all the past issues of the Journal of Law and Economics and work through them. And so that's what I did. I took a year and about four hours a morning from about 8 to 12, worked through the Journal of Law and Economics. This is the year after I graduated from, from college. So that's kind of how I did it in steps. I certainly think a free society needs a political theory, and I'll say a little about that, and an economic theory in a different way. We need a political theory because we need to have a view of the proper role of the, rela of the proper relationship between people and each other, and between people and the government if there's to be a government. And you can't really have an idea of people's rights without having that theory, that political theory. I think it needs an economic theory in a different sense, a narrower sense, and that is the economic theory should be a spin-off of the political theory. In other words, if people have rights, what does this imply for the economy? Well, it implies that people should be free to buy and sell what they want as long as it isn't, you know, as long as they're not buying and selling slaves. It means people should be able to price at what they want to price things at. People should be able to work in any occupation they want as long as it's not being a hitman or something like that. And so, yes, an economic theory in that narrow sense. Economic theory to economists means something completely different. And economic theory to economists means a theory about how the economy actually works. And I think you need some basic understanding of how an economy works in order to be able to understand why you don't need a big role for government. But I don't think you need to pick a particular economic theory. So for example, there's a large debate among economists who are strong believers in the free market between so-called Austrian economists and so-called Chicago economists. And a lot of people have called me a Chicago economist. 
Um, we used to joke that I went to UCLA for my PhD. I went to the University of Chicago at Los Angeles. Uh, but I don't think you need to resolve those issues in order to have a very, in order to have the economic theory you need to justify, defend, and promote a free society. And so I'm a big tent person in that sense, that uh, there are things in Austrian economics I agree with, things I don't, but we can be just as avid promoters and believers in freedom, no matter what our view is, say, on the business cycle. I'd say the basic theme there is that a little thinking goes a long way. The reason we came up with that book, it's my only co-authored book, co-authored with a former student of mine, Charlie Hooper, was we were talking over the years about various decisions he was seeing people make in his consulting business, often bad decisions, sometimes good decisions, where they were just violating basic precepts of economics. I mean, they weren't thinking on the margin or they weren't remembering what's a sunk cost and what's not, those kinds of things. And then every once in a while there'd be a good decision he'd report to me and we'd say that's interesting too where it's just an application of basic economics. So the idea was we would write a book together and it would be an application of what we said were three things. Economics, basic economics, decision theory, and common sense, which we think is way less common than the name would imply. Mm -hmm. And so that's kind of, that's what that book's about. We do, we tell a lot of stories, virtually all of them true, and when they're not true, we say so, uh, about bad and good decisions and what particular principle was violated or followed to make, to reach that decision. Well, I had the idea back in about 1983 that the world was ready for an encyclopedia of economics, and it was a set of conversations that led me to that. I was working in the Reagan administration at the Council of Economic Advisors, and two of my colleagues that year were Paul Krugman, who now writes for the New York Times, and Larry Summers, who went on to become Treasury Secretary under Clinton and was Obama's chief economic advisor till recently. And what I noticed in our conversations at lunch was especially on the issues of microeconomics, dealing with particular markets as opposed to macroeconomics, which is about inflation, unemployment, and so on, that there was a lot of agreement. Price controls are bad, rent controls are bad, minimum wage puts young people out of work, those kinds of things. And our attitudes towards those things were different. Uh, the free market types at the Council of Economic Advisors like Ben Zyker and Lincoln Anderson, and I liked those conclusions. People like Paul Krugman and Larry Summers didn't like them much, as much, but they grudgingly admitted them. And I thought, you know, the world is due for an encyclopedia. And I put that thought aside. I started writing a lot for Fortune in the 80s. And then Fortune, after Time and Warner merged, Fortune approached me to um, see if I wanted to do an encyclopedia. And uh, I thought about it. and outlined what I would do and they bought off on it and that's that's how that happened. Mm -hmm. And in fact, by the way, Paul Krugman and Larry Summers are both in that first edition. The first edition went out of print in the mid-90s. The rights reverted to me and I was at a Liberty Fund conference with um, the chairman of Liberty Fund, Alan Russell, in 2000 and he said, you know, the encyclopedia should be put online. And I thought, great idea. And so we negotiated a deal where I would license them to put it online. That was the easy money. The hard money was coming up with a second edition. And I thought it'd be relatively straightforward, but really when I sat down to do it, almost every article needed some improvement. And I'd say 40 or so of them, 50 maybe, needed substantial rewriting and maybe another 50 medium rewriting. So that, anyway, that's how that happened. I think the second edition is a substantial improvement over the first. The nice thing is with the web space being so cheap, both editions are on the web.